Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the bright lights. Not so bright as last time. We're still learning how to operate our wonderful new auditorium, but uh, all uh, distinctly comfortable this evening uh, of the Legatum uh, Institute, uh, a public policy unit uh, dedicated to the study of the issues of our times and to the advancements of prosperity, comprehensively understood both materially, intellectually, and culturally. And fundamental to the work of our institute is the Culture of Prosperity program that I have the distinct honor to organize and administer. Most think tanks, many, many think tanks anyway, do uh, encourage the discussion of economic issues and political issues, uh, but the position that is occupied by our Legatum Institute is unique since it is uh, devoted to more comprehensive understanding of these issues, and especially so through the History of Capitalism course, now in its second year. And it's uh, a very great pleasure for us to be able to have this chance to welcome back to the Legatum Institute, uh, David Abulafia, uh, whose researches have cast uh, so lucid a light on the issues that surround Mediterranean civilization, the culture of the Middle Ages, uh, and whose researches have now acquired an oceanic dimension, uh, as you'll see from the, the map that, uh, uh, that is ahead of you there. Uh, when David came last to the Gotham Institute, he delivered the uh, second talk uh, in the introductory course in the history of capitalism, in the course of which he outlined with his uh, custom, wit, brilliance, and powers of elucidation, uh, the nature of the medieval societies and the economies thereof. Uh, he will be very familiar to you as uh, the author most recently of The Great Sea, an account of the Mediterranean, uh, oceanic, uh, vast subject in itself, since uh, in that uh, volume he took uh, uh, the dimensions not just decades or centuries, but uh, of millennia. Uh, and now he comes back to us in the second year of this course, uh, during which we'll be looking again in chronological survey, in chronological survey, various particular issues within uh, the history of capitalism. And uh, David is going to be talking this evening about the role of the trader in ancient societies, uh, not just within this tiny little thing called the Mediterranean over there, um, but he's, uh, he's been embarking in the last 12 months on an oceanic exploration that takes him along what is before the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, and thereof. Um, this is rather... Um, a recent map, really, mm. uh, in terms yeah. of, uh, yeah. of David's yeah. perspective. A hundred years, more us. than a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it will guide you, uh, as indeed David Abulafia will now be guiding you through this uh, fascinating question, the role of the trader in ancient societies. Very warm welcome back to the Lugatum Institute, David Abulafia. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here again. And um, I suppose an alternative title uh, for this lecture would be Global Trade, The Beginnings. What I'm really going to be talking about is the origins, as I see it, of uh, the creation of a global economy. And globalization is very much in the news nowadays. And it seems to me that we can actually trace this back very much further in time than people have generally assumed. But I actually want to begin with something that happened very recently. I, my eye was caught by an article in the Financial Times in October 2014, an article called Geopolitics Risks Derailing Silk Road. And this was about how the Chinese president has been promoting a scheme for a new rail link which will carry freight from central China uh, it'll go sort of somewhere like that, I suppose, uh, central China, all across uh, Asia, uh, f and it will arrive in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, Russia, Belarus, Poland, and ultimately Germany. And uh, this, of course, would complement the existing Trans-Siberian Railway. Now, the idea then is to shift vast amounts of goods from the Far East by rail to Europe. The Trans-Siberian Railway, in fact, already carries an enormous amount of goods uh, produced by Hewlett Packard at Chongqing in south-central China. But if you compare the overland route, or the rail route, which now operates between China and the West, 
with the sea route, which is what I'll be talking about much further back in time, you will find that the sea route massively predominates. Each week, about 250 containers arrive in Germany by train. This is a small fraction of the capacity of the container ships, some of which, of course, can easily take 250 containers themselves. Uh, and uh, moreover, the cost of sending things by sea is actually lower, about 20% lower than the cost of sending them by land. So, of course, there are fears about the viability of the rail route, and particularly because tension between Russia and the West remains high. So actually making this work between China and Germany is obviously a problem. So this really put me in mind of the comparison with the ancient and medieval world. We tend to think of the famous Silk Road, which crossed the Gobi Desert and went all the way to the top of the Black Sea, or even north of that, and linked uh, Europe uh, and Central Asia to China. Uh, but what I'm actually going to be telling you is about how much more important what historians are now tending to call the Maritime Silk Road, this route, was actually uh, for a great many centuries. Right, so what I'm talking about today reflects an interest which came out of my book. I wrote this big book, as you heard from Howell, very, very kind of him to mention it, called The Great Sea, which is a history of the Mediterranean. And so now I'm engaged on a sort of companion volume, which is a history of the oceans. Now, taking the oceans together, of course, it's a much, much larger physical space than the Mediterranean. How does one actually do that? It seemed to me that I would have to write about interconnections within the oceans and between the oceans, and between the oceans and the Mediterranean. And in all of this, in actually understanding how these different seaways functioned, Obviously, what comes to the fore is not just explorers, it's not just pilgrims, it's the merchants, it's the trade routes that really feature very prominently. It's a difficult thing to do because you really need to have a mastery over all sorts of languages like Chinese and Persian and Japanese and so on, and, and various Indian languages and so on, which I certainly don't have. Uh, but on the other hand, there has been this shift among historians in recent years to a much more sort of global view of problems uh, and actually trying to work out how our relatively little world of Western Europe uh, the Mediterranean is connected to a much bigger picture, seems to me one of the big challenges that historians place, uh, face nowadays. Now, in about 40 minutes, I don't have the time to mobilize all the examples I would like to cite. I would have liked to have talked, for instance, about Japan, Hakata, now known as Fukuoka, which was a very important center of trade between China and Japan during the Middle Ages. Uh, and which was attacked by the Mongols in a great invasion in the 13th century, which stands really at the center of Japanese historical consciousness. Uh, Changzhou in China, uh, opposite uh, Taiwan. I will talk, however, about a number of centers, Aden in Yemen and, and this coast, Mangalore, which you see on the map there. These are places which I've selected uh, for their importance in understanding how these routes across the sea actually functioned. Can I produce any grand generalizations? Well, at the moment, the generalization I want to put in front of you is a very simple one. And it is that from uh, around the time of Christ onwards, maritime networks linked the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean and the Indian Ocean to China um, and funneled goods in both directions in quite astonishing quantities. So we have hundreds of thousands of porcelain bowls which were sent out from Changshu in the 12th century in this direction towards Malaysia, Indonesia, and then out through this route so that when you get to Cairo, to a particular suburb of Cairo, which I'll be talking about called Fustat or Old Cairo, archaeologists looking at this site, looking at 11th, 12th century remains in the site, they've recovered 700,000 fragments of Chinese porcelain. I mean, this is an extraordinary amount that's actually coming on these ships. And the shipwrecks which have been found in these waters, quite a large number of shipwrecks. And again, these ships laden with tens of thousands of porcelain bowls. Uh, what I should, of course, explain is that the technique of producing this translucent porcelain was something which at this period was unique to China. Uh, 
So the scale of this trade casts doubt on the work. There's work that historians tend to cite again and again and again by an American scholar called Janet Abu Luhod, who wrote this book, Before European Hegemony. And so her argument was that when the Mongols created this great empire, which included not just China, uh, but large amounts of Russia, stretched right up to Central Europe, included Persia as well, for her, that was the moment when the Silk Road revived and a global economy came into being. And it seems to me that this is really missing the point that that economy had been functioning for a long time before that. And moreover, that the way it had functioned had been very much through the maritime networks. Right, so what we're talking about is networks which carried goods, spices in particular, spices coming from what's now Indonesia. Uh, they carry these goods up into the Red Sea, as we shall see, then they're, they, they debouch into the Mediterranean through Alexandria and other places, and then sometimes they're being carried way beyond that into the North Sea, into the Baltic, as far as places like Riga, which was an important trading center of the Middle Ages. So prodigious amounts of goods, which lead to the creation of a series of trade routes all connected to one another that link um, the furthest parts of Northern Europe to Japan. It's not that people in Northern Europe knew anything about Japan. They knew a little about it because Marco Polo had written about it, but most of what he said was invention anyway. Um, and people in Japan knew nothing about Europe. But in the middle, there were certainly people looking in both ways who knew a lot about what was going on in the Chinese empire and how to supply the economic desires of the Chinese and also how to supply the economic desires of people living in the Middle East and even Western Europe. There's uh, an important problem here which economic historians have to grapple with, which is what was the impact of what was predominantly a luxury trade aimed at elite consumers. Uh, we're talking of the trade in silk. We're talking of sometimes quite expensive spices. How does this impact on the economic developments of the lands that this trade touched? And as you'll see, some of the cities where these merchants are passing they're bringing the goods through these cities. And in some of these places, you're going to find that the local ruler enriches himself very much from the passage of trade through these cities. And it seems to me, if you want to ask yourself a very simple question, why were spices so expensive in the Mediterranean world in the Middle Ages and the early modern period? Hideously expensive, but in great demand. Uh, and they're coming all the way from here, a lot of them and they're passing from one custom station to another, and they're being taxed, uh, and so the price is constantly being forked up and forked up and forked up. So by the time they actually reach Alexandria and then go on to Venice or wherever it is, they have become very expensive. But in themselves, they're basically agricultural products from this area, some of them rarer than others. Pepper was produced in absolutely enormous quantities there, and then in India as well. Uh, it's not as if these were particularly rare items. People in Western Europe often didn't know what these spices were. They were often very puzzled. Uh, they would receive these dried objects, which had traveled for thousands of miles, and they would question whether, whether they were animal, vegetable, or mineral. Uh, there was a real question. They knew nothing about the origins of them. In the 13th century, Marco Polo, as a result of his travels in China, told them a little bit about how these items were produced. But even in the 16th, 17th centuries, people were very uncertain about <coughs> uh, the origins of spices and things that we now think of as, 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 uh, as vegetable matter. They really thought, you know, might be the product of some animal or something like that. Now, let's go far back in time first and see how the Indian Ocean actually opened up as a great highway of trade. And here we have to consider the competition between two areas. One is the Persian Gulf. Now, if you go to the Persian Gulf nowadays, and particularly if you go to the Gulf states, you have to be very careful not to call it the Persian Gulf. But actually, the ancient Greeks called it the Persian Gulf. It's all to do with modern politics, uh, Iran and everything. Uh, so you've got the Persian Gulf as one waterway, which gives access to the Arabian Sea and ultimately the Indian Ocean. And then we've got a rival route leading from the Middle East, which is the Red Sea. 
Now, if we go right back in time, we find that the first area really to have developed commercial links with the Indian Ocean was there was a series of civilizations which were established in this part of what's now Iraq, the Sumerian civilization, uh, which is really, in a sense, the first advanced civilization, I have to say, cities, writing, uh, big temples, and so on, and a very active trade network. And what we begin to see around 2500 BC is the movement of merchants down the Persian Gulf, very often stopping at Bahrain, which is nowadays a little kingdom on its own, which they knew as Dilmun. And Dilmun itself, this term Dilmun, had sort of rather fantastic connotations of a rather magical territory. So we're dealing with a period, 2500 BC, when people are not very familiar with the sea. But what they knew was that down here in Oman, they could gain considerable quantities of copper, which was very important for the cities up here. They needed it for their own uh, weapons and things like that. And then they also began to open up trade routes to a land called Melucha. Now, this is actually something of enormous interest because right, the Sumerian civilization based in Iraq, we've got the Egyptians over here, I'll come back to them later. Uh, and then you have a third civilization about which much less is known, which is the Indus Valley civilization. And in fact, the Indus Valley civilization covered quite a large arc of land, including a lot of that coastline there. So what we begin to find is that this land, the Indus Valley land, which was known to the inhabitants of Sumer, of Ur of the Chaldees and these other cities in, in the area around Basra, uh, this, um, me, this land of the Indus Valley was known as Melucha, and they were trading with it very actively. So it's really the first contact between two major civilizations conducted by maritime trade. But what is really remarkable, and I think fits very well into a series of lectures on the history of capitalism, is how we actually have documents left by these Sumerians in their language, which, I, I mean, it's very difficult to read. It's a miracle anybody ever managed to decipher it. And these documents, you read them uh, in translation, I should say, uh, and you say to yourself, I feel that I could be in 13th century Barcelona, I could be in 17th century Amsterdam. The terms, the arrangements that are being described are very, very familiar from uh, documents much, much later in time. Let me quote one of these documents. Lu Meslemtaye and Nigsi Sanabsa have borrowed from Urnimar to Minas. To, this is a quantity, a wage quantity, two minas of silver, five kur of sesame oil, 30 garments, for an expedition to Dilmun, as I said, Bahrain, to buy copper there. On the safe return of the expedition, the creditor will not make a claim for any commercial losses. The debtors have mutually agreed to satisfy Urnimar with four minas of copper for each shekel, a weight of silver, as a just price. This they have sworn before the king. And this forms part of the business correspondence of a merchant of Ur of the Chaldees, about here, which was uh, found by a British archaeologist nearly 100 years ago, Sir Leonard Woolley, who excavated triumphal ex excavation, in which he actually excavated the house of this merchant, uh, Ur Nimar, uh, and uh, he was able to... Uh, to excavate also part of his archives. And this was a man who was particularly interested in copper from, uh, from South Arabia. And the quantities of copper were absolutely astonishing. One of his shipments weighed 18 and a half metric tons, of which nearly a third belonged to him. Now, the archive of this man also contains some very interesting information about how business was conducted at another level, the problem of complaints, the problem of getting compensation when the goods are not to your satisfaction. So listen to this. Speak to Air Nasir. This is a, speak to a merchant called Air Nasir. Thus says Nani, now when you had come, you spoke saying thus, <coughs> I will give good ingots to Gimil Sin. This you said to me when you had come, but you've not done it. You've offered bad ingots to my messenger saying, if you will take it, take it. If you will not take it, go away. Who am I that you're treating me in this manner, treating me with some, such contempt? 
and between gentlemen such as we are. Who is there among the Dillman traders who have acted against me in this way? So, uh, so commercial disputes already emerging in this part of the world concerning these trade routes to Saudi Arabia and to India. Now, these routes um, were parallel to some extent by an expansion of ancient Egyptian trade. Every now and again, the pharaohs in the same sort of period, in the second millennium BC or whenever, would launch trading expeditions to a land they called Punt, which seems to have been really this sort of area, what's now Somalia, Eritrea, and so on. Uh, and they were in search of products like ivory and ebony and so on. These were royal expeditions launched by the pharaohs, sometimes very big ones. And what's interesting is that in that period, there's that going on, and there's that going on, but it doesn't all connect yet. And the people who really connect it are the Greeks and the Romans, or at least, I should say, people living under Greek and Roman rule in Egypt, up here, who became the great experts much later, I would say in the time of Christ, became the great experts on Indian Ocean navigation. So what we begin to see around, the, around 2,000 years ago is the integration of this area and the creation of a sort of common trading area linking a great many of the lands in the Indian Ocean. So the first thing that the, these Greco-Roman merchants had to do uh, they're based in Egypt, so they tend to use the Red Sea as their channel into the Indian Ocean, and they have to work out how to master the monsoons. One of the great problems of sailing in the Indian Ocean is you have to be uh, aware of the monsoon season. You can obviously only, uh, only trade at certain times of the year when the monsoons are favourable to you, but if you use the monsoon cleverly, it will blow you right across. So the ancient Greeks managed to create a route which took them out of sight of land, straight across in a matter of days really, being just wafted across by the winds to South India. And you begin to see the development of commercial settlements linked to Rome itself uh, in South India. Uh, along here you, you hear about uh, merchants reaching Ceylon, Sri Lanka, uh, you hear, about here there's a town, you can just see it, Pondicherry, which later on became a French colony. But in the ancient world, under the name of Arikamedu, uh, it seems this was the furthest limit reached by these merchants who had come out of Greek and Roman Egypt and were bringing spices. And the quantity of spices that the ancient Romans imported is truly staggering. I mean, the city of Rome and Ostia, the port of Rome, contained these warehouses which were full to the brim. I mean, rooms far larger than this, full to the brim of dried pepper. So pepper was actually being consumed right across the, uh, as a social fabric, I mean, by people of all social classes in, in ancient Rome. Not the very poorest, certainly, but uh, the very wealthy as in medieval Europe, but also people much lower down the social scale, what you might call a sort of urban lower middle class. And we know that in order to reach these places, as a result of very impressive archaeological excavations, a number of towns were founded along the coast of the Red Sea. They were founded in places as close as possible to the River Nile. So as you brought the goods up to this place called Berenike, which is about here, and then you would unload the goods at Berenike, which has been dug up by American archaeologists, and then you would go across to the Nile just where it was closest to the Red Sea, uh, so you'd actually sometimes even dismantle the ships and carry them on camel's backs to the Nile and then reconstruct them, quite extraordinary, and then sail them down to Alexandria, which at that point was the great port linking the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean. Right, now, the Red Sea, by and large, was the route that people preferred to take in order to make this contact between the Mediterranean or the Middle East and the Indian Ocean. But it's quite interesting just to look at the oscillation between the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, that at different times, different seas were more important. And this tells one a lot about the uh, political changes which were taking place in the Islamic world in particular. So we're now in the uh, seventh, eighth centuries AD, and during this period, power shifted back and forth the founders of the Islamic Caliphate, who 
base their power really in this sort of area and then obviously down towards Mecca as well. Um, they were displaced in the 8th century by another dynasty, a rival dynasty, the Abbasids, who established their own capital at Baghdad and other towns in this sort of region. So during that period, we find that the Persian Gulf came into its own as a very important center of commercial activity. And it's not just commercial activity. We have to remember that as these ships move back and forth along these routes, they're also bringing ideas and sometimes the objects themselves convey ideas. I mean, you've got, for instance, once you get into these waters, you've got uh, Buddhist uh, models of the Buddhist saints, that sort of thing, moving back and forth. You've got pilgrims going back and forth as well. So there are cultural influences which are also moving across these waters in that period. And some British archaeologists, actually, they, uh, they dug up a place called Siraf, which I'll come back to about here on the coast of Iran, Persia, uh, which was one of the great centers of trade, but I'll come back to that in a minute. What's interesting about the traders who moved along these seas in, let's say, the 8th, 9th century is how varied they were in identity. The Chinese tended to call them the possu, and possu seems to be a form of the word Persian, right? So that would locate them there. But they seem to have used it as a generic term, really, to describe merchants of all sorts of origins. So we have Arabs, we have Jews, we have uh, people from South India, Tamils and people like that. And these people became increasingly familiar, particularly in southern China, where they set up colonies. Uh, and um, what we begin to see is also the, 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 the development of these settlements in southern China in response not just to circumstances over here, but also to circumstances in China. During the 11th, 12th centuries, the, the emperors, the Song emperors in China, basically they control the south of China, but the north has been lost to what they call barbarians, to various rivals. Now, the effect of this was that the overland route, such as it was, and I've already qualified the argument that it was tremendously important, but the overland route, the Silk Road, as we tend to call it, was inaccessible. And on the other hand, the maritime routes, given that Sung power was concentrated here, were easily accessible. And something actually very remarkable happened in the economic history of China in that period, in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, which was the opening up, though some of the emperors had doubts about this, the opening up of maritime trade, not just to foreign ships, but even encouraging Chinese merchants to get on board their junks and sampans and so on, and to trade out towards the sea. The relationship between China and the sea had often been a rather sort of reserved, negative <laughs> one, in which China had received ships from abroad, but the Chinese themselves don't seem to have wanted to do much more than navigate the rivers and navigate along the coast. But we're now looking at them penetrating right down to some of these islands, uh, Sumatra, Java, and so on. And these islands were coming into their own in a very important way too. Uh, I keep going on about spices. And the really important thing to remember about the spice trade in the Middle Ages when it becomes really uh, famous for the amounts that it's bringing through Alexandria to the Mediterranean is that the source of the spices shifted quite significantly in the Middle Ages. Whereas the Romans had basically been exploiting this sort of area with occasional forays towards Sumatra and so on. In the Middle Ages, partly as a result of Chinese demand for these products, not just pepper, but a product called camphor, which was made from a particularly big uh, sort of tree. Um, they were penetrating into these islands, and so this became the great source of spices and perfumes. And although we tend to think of the great spice trade to the Mediterranean as the money spinner, Actually, at various points, if you were to situate yourself, say, in the 12th century, you'd probably find that about five times the quantity of spices was traveling up from Indonesia towards China. But the fundamental point was, of course, right, Chinese merchants were involved in this, but this was also stimulating economic activities among the peoples that we don't really hear about so much. 
So you have a lot of, you have certainly Arab merchants, and as we'll hear, we'll also have Jewish merchants who are coming down to the coast of India from the Mediterranean. But beyond that, a great many Tamils from South India trading towards what's now Malaysia, Indonesia. The Indonesians and Malays themselves, very, very active and really dominating the traffic towards China and towards uh, southern India. We actually have some quite remarkable documents which have survived from uh, 864 AD, which were uh, written on copper plate. And these documents commemorate the merchants who had been living in, um, in one of the South Indian cities, a place called Quilon. Uh, and the king uh, there, the king, he has set up two guilds, one guild which consists of foreign merchants, which trades very actively towards south, towards Aden, South Arabia, and then up the Red Sea, and another guild consisting of Tamil merchants who trade in that direction. They're under his protection, and he gives them an enormous amount of freedom. He basically says, all right, you go ahead, you collect the taxes, I will just sort of um, sit here and rake in the profits. Uh, and of course, they're very glad to have his protection. Um, and that, of course, is the point. From the perspective of these rulers, encouraging this sort of trade in spices, it was a tremendous money spinner. These goods were passing through their custom stations and being taxed very effectively. We begin, uh, once we get into the 12th century thereabouts, we begin to develop a sense of who these merchants were. We have uh, accounts of exceptionally wealthy merchants. I suppose the place to begin, really, is one of those most remarkable parts of the Arabian Nights, Thousand and One Nights, the description, the story of Sinbad the Sailor. And you may remember, uh, Sinbad, actually there are two Sinbads in the story. There's Sinbad, who is a sort of down and out in Baghdad, and then there's Sinbad, the very wealthy merchant, who, discovering that this down and out is also called Sinbad, invites him to feasts and starts telling him stories of his life because he had started very modestly and had become exceptionally wealthy through his maritime trade. Um, and we actually have real figures who are a bit like this. There's a man called Ramisht, who in the middle of the 12th century turns up in all sorts of documents. Uh, and uh, we know, for instance, that he was so fabulously wealthy that he covered the Kaaba, the, the, the cube in the middle of the great mosque in Mecca with Chinese silk cloth. That must have cost him a pretty penny, according to the document we have, the value of which cannot be estimated. Uh, and we hear that even his clerk, whom he sent to China, his merchandise was worth half a million dinars, that's gold coins. Now, even allowing for exaggeration, if his clerk is worth a great deal of money, you can remember, you can imagine what Ramisht might have been uh, worth. And he came from this town, Siraf, which I've mentioned before, which actually, by the 12th century, was undergoing hard times. It had passed its most glorious moment because now it was the traffic down the Red Sea which was really important. He operated ships. He actually, sometimes he had enough ships to, I suppose, survive the disasters that sometimes struck them. We hear of his ships sometimes sinking. And we also hear of his ships coming to the defense of the city of Aden when it was being attacked by pirates from the Persian Gulf in the middle of the 12th century. He was a person of enormous importance and had a sort of world reputation. Now, much of what we actually know about what was going on in the Indian Ocean comes from a group of papers. I mean, they are paper, they're um, medieval paper documents, which were found over 100 years ago in the storeroom of a synagogue in Cairo, in old Cairo, a suburb of Cairo called Fustat. And these documents, the Cairo Geniza documents, uh, bring to life, uh, a great many commercial letters exist, things like this. So they bring to life the life, not just the humdrum business, you know, commercial transactions, you can quantify to some extent, but beyond that also the mental world of the merchants, because a lot of them are actually letters which express, you know, fears, doubts, um, they want information about the price of pepper, the other side of the Indian Ocean, and so on. And you begin to realize what an enormous network was created, which effectively spread all the way from Spain 
uh, the uh, merchants, Jewish and other merchants in Spain, which large parts of which were under Muslim rule at that period, and then through Sicily, North Africa, and so on, down through Cairo, which was the nodal point, really, into the Red Sea. Uh, and we hear um, a great deal about certain merchants who had really uh, major ambitions in the Indian Ocean. And I want to talk about one in particular man called Abraham ben Yiju. Abraham ben Yiju came from a town called Mahdia, which is to the south of Tunis, he came, what's now Tunisia, a very important commercial town on the coast of Tunisia. But he had moved with his family to Cairo, uh, with his sort of brothers and whatnot, to Cairo, and he'd become one of these merchants trading towards India in spices and so on. And so in the middle of the 12th century, he did something extremely adventurous. He set up in Mangalore, he set up a bronze workshop. He went to live in Mangalore. He married a young woman from Mangalore. Uh, she was actually his slave, but he emancipated her, which um, then led to her conversion to Judaism and her, they married, they had children and so on. And he lived for about 17 years here. And he would migrate back and forth occasionally to Aden because as well as Cairo, Aden was a tremendously important center of the Indian Ocean traffic in this period. And you can see why Aden's important, because it faces in every direction. It faces up the Red Sea towards Egypt. You've got a great deal of activity across to Africa. You've got all that ivory and ebony and so on, slaves as well, though uh, Ben Yiju wasn't involved in the slave trade really, but uh, you've got slaves coming up from there who are in demand in Egypt. And then you've also got the spice trade going across to India and then beyond India to Indonesia and Malaysia. Sometimes people found these journeys in the Indian Ocean quite a challenge. Um, we have an account by one merchant. He turns up at one of these ports in the Red Sea, uh, of which there were several giving access to the Nile and ultimately to Cairo, and he finds that most of the Indian Ocean ships were not nailed together they were tied together by sort of rope. Uh, the, the beams the, and so on were tied together. Uh, this actually gave them greater flexibility, but it was a little bit alarming. The ships obviously uh, were much more flexible, which when you're on board could give you a rather strange feeling, no doubt induce quite severe seasickness indeed. So um, we have this marvelous account, uh, one of these letters in the, from this synagogue in Cairo from the 12th century. We set sail in a ship with not a single nail of iron in it, but held together by ropes. May God protect it with his shield. I'm about to cross the great ocean, not a sea like the Mediterranean. I do not know if we will ever meet again. So there's that sort of worry about uh, crossing the sea. Now, one of the questions that we have about these merchants, these Jewish merchants from Cairo, is how typical they were. Uh, was there, so because they weren't actually members of the majority religion, Muslims, uh, so are they typical in some way? Did they have different sorts of networks? And actually, in the last few years, they have discovered a lot of letters left by a Muslim merchant who lived on the shores of the Mediterranean, uh, sorry, of the Red Sea, about here, in a place called Kuzair al-Kadim. And he, this man, um, he's a sort of general merchant. He runs a sort of general stores. And at some, for some reason, uh, maybe when he died or something, somebody screwed up his papers and just sort of left them in the sand. And because it's so dry, they were preserved. And about 150 of his letters have come to light. And you get a sense of how it's not just the spice trade, in which the Jews are more interested, perhaps, the grain trade, in which this man was interested, and so on, textiles, everything you could imagine, coming up the Red Sea, things being taken across these great distances across the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, and archaeology has confirmed what's in this man's letters. Uh, fragments, I mean, they, they, they can now, of course, identify the uh, material remains, the organic remains, dates, almonds, watermelons, pistachios, cardamom, black pepper, rice, aubergine. They've all been found in the excavations at this place, Kuzer uh, al-Qadim. And even uh, what may be little printed texts written in Arabic, but possibly printed in China, uh, because printing hadn't taken off in this part of the world or in Europe, but uh, the Chinese were already printing, using block printing. They would sort of carve a block, and there are these amulets, uh, which 
uh, survive from Kuzer al Kadim, which may have been brought all the way along these routes. Uh, so, um, what we're looking at, therefore, is networks which, by the 12th century, were really flourishing extremely actively uh, and which tied together particular parts of the Indian Ocean. There were other parts, too, that entered into relationship. The coast of East Africa, we know that when Vasco da Gama in the late 15th century, when he goes on his great expedition, opening up the Portuguese route around Africa to arrive at Calicut, uh, he meets Arab merchants along this coast. Zanzibar was a very important center of Arab trade. And Madagascar, extraordinarily, had actually been colonized not by Arab merchants, not by black Africans, but by the inhabitants of this area. The language of Madagascar, the ethnic origins of the Madagascar people, the Malagasis, actually lie over here. So some of these connections, some of these Malays, they weren't just moving in that direction, they were also moving down, perhaps taking advantage of the monsoons and so on. Very ambitious expeditions across the sea. But um, now, um, what I'm therefore trying to say is that we can talk about a process of a sort of proto-globalization, which is actually linking together uh, areas which are physically very apart, far apart from one another, even though, and this is a very important point, not very many of these merchants from Cairo actually visit Sumatra, for instance. This is all done in stages, with the Tamils or the Malays taking goods as far as this, and then various other people, Arabs, Jews, or whatever, taking the goods in this section. And clearly, in this area, we've got Malays, we, sometimes we've got Chinese as well. So it's, it's all divided up into sections, but the sections connect. They relate to one another. And there are big profits for those who are very attentive to the goods coming down these channels. As I've said, vast amounts of porcelain. Somehow, orders must have been sent all the way from Cairo to China. We don't have any record of how that was done. Um, there were some quite important economic effects of these developments, and I'd like to conclude with that. A great many of the goods which were being acquired didn't just come from here. As I say, they often came from here as well, from the Indian kingdoms. And what was actually happening was that in order to pay for these goods, we find very large quantities of European silver and gold from the Middle East and so on being used to, to pay for these items. And when this bullion arrives in Indian courts or Indonesian courts or whatever, it tends to be immobilized. It tends to be put into the treasury. Some of it is spent on luxuries. But there's this process of what the French call tesorisation, uh, treasurization, uh, which is taking place. And this actually has some very major economic effects. It actually leads to a shortage of silver currency in the Islamic world uh, and to some extent in Europe as well. It, it's quite extraordinary that money is draining towards these places where it seems to go into a sort of bottomless pit. And the Chinese experience something actually quite similar as well, I should say, because an enormous amount of copper coinage was moving towards Japan, Korea, and so on in the same period. They were very alarmed about the uh, disappearance of bullion, and this clearly had uh, quite significant effects on prices and so on at home. Well, so what I'm really saying is that if we set aside the Americas, which of course were another world, which were not connected to, uh, to Asia or Europe until 1492, and even then took some time to be drawn into what you might call a world system, a world system had actually come into being. And what really played a fundamental role in the creation of this world system was this maritime trade which stretched all the way from the Sea of Japan to the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Thank you.